So neuroglia, these are the support cells that we find in nervous tissue. And the neuroglia, again, this is this is a class of cells. Not a CD. This is a class of cells. Meaning that they're this is just one term that's used for several different types of cells. Those cells are going to be location dependent. So whenever we find them within the uh, nervous system, we're going to have certain type of neuroglia that we only find there, and then neuroglia in other parts of the nervous system that have some slightly different names, yet some seemingly similar functions. So as you're probably guessing, those two places, central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. Within the central nervous system, and you can see here, that this is our neuron, and then we have a bunch of different uh, examples of neuroglia here. And these are going to be the uh, uh, typical of the neuroglia that we find in the central nervous system. So one of those is the oligodendrocyte. So the oligodendrocytes these are going to be neuroglia that have a body, so a main part of the cell, but then they have these arm-like projections. These arms, as they extend out, they're extensions of the cell membrane, and they're going to wrap around the neurons, is which this is what you can see occurring here. So those extensions of the membrane, they wrap around many times, so you get this sheath or this rolling uh, around the neuron. This forms what's known as myelin. And specifically, since the oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system, it's going to be the myelin that we find associated with neurons in the brain and in the spinal cord. So what is, what is, it, what is the possible purpose here for these oligodendrocytes? Why are we wrapping up the axons? Okay, so protection. Does anyone, so um, the wires here that are running into the lights, they're wrapped up as well, right? You've all probably seen electrical wire before. It has that plastic sheath around the outside. Does anyone know what that's for? We used to have an electrical system that's in really old houses called knob and tube. You can just open copper wire that just was like throughout the whole house. So you can attach it right up to the wood studs. We've moved away from novelty. And the reason is, is because it was a very uh, inefficient form of electrical conduction. The signals were very slow. Then we started adding copper wire, which made it safer because you don't have exposed open electrical current flowing through your house. But it also increased the transmission speed because you don't lose as much of that electromagnetic uh, uh, information out into the environment. It doesn't radiate out into the environment. Same thing happens here. We can have a neuron that doesn't have any sort of covering and the signals are very, very slow. Or we can wrap them up with oligodendrocytes in the uh, central nervous system or Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system and we can increase signals from uh, very slow to being ultra fast, 120 meters a second. So you would want them to be faster there because... Where? In the brain itself. Like okay. you would want that. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so I got 100, 120 I... meters a second is going to take a signal milliseconds to travel from... If it has the mile. To, 
yeah, to travel along that neuron. Okay? If it's unmyelinated, it's like one to two meters a second, which means all of you can run faster than that signal. Okay? So let me uh, put it in real terms. Here. Do you want a myelinated fiber or an unmyelinated fiber innervating the tissue of your hand when you put it on a hot stove? So there are times when you want that signal to go super fast. So, uh, but then all of them are like every nerve. Nope. Not all of them are myelinated. Do you want to regulate blood pressure in such a way that you have changes that occur on the millisecond or that occur over prolonged periods of time? So there are some things that we want to have slower signals. A lot of things we want to have a lot faster signals. If you're crossing the road and some bus barrels over a hill, you want to have a quick reaction time. Not like, oh, I probably should move. <laughs> what are the you saying? Arms wrap, Arms wrap around the neuron, so those projections, which you can see in a couple different locations, these come off extensions of the membrane, and they wrap around that neuron. It's kind of like a pencil, but the, the wrap in here, the myelin sheet is kind of like taking a pencil and wrapping it around a piece of paper. Like, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so it would look something like that. <laughs> and we're going to actually come back and we're going to talk, we're going to discuss why it actually increases speed. You know, but we're going we're gonna to get there <laughs> someday. <laughs> <laughs> the second type of cell is the ependymal cell. Epidymal. And the epidymal cells are going to be found lining the cranial and spinal cavities. From their position lining both of these cavities, they are the main secretors of cerebral spinal fluid. We would call C yes, cerebral spinal fluid. So I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Mary. Cabinets. You don't see the epidymal cells here in this figure just because this is incorporated into the nervous tissue. These are going to be incorporated into the lines uh, along the edges of the cranial and spinal cavities. But you do see microglial cells. And the microglia, these have an origin from blood cells. So these are similar to what we would find in the blood and other tissues, um, white blood cells. These are a more mobile cell that are going to be able to travel around the central nervous system. And they have uh, finger-like projections that they use to collect debris. finger-like projections to collect, collect up debris, and then they destroy that debris, things like microorganisms. And other foreign materials. And obviously this description here, finger-like projections collecting debris, it's solid debris, it's a lot of it. So it's probably, 
I got a lot of debris that I reach out and I grab and I pull it into the cell. Okay, what specific type of endocytosis? Solid debris, phagocytosis. So proud of you, Paige. You're learning. And then we have these really weird looking star shaped cells called astrocytes, hence the name, because it looks sort of star shaped. So this is a star shaped cell. Uh, this is actually the most prominent in the central nervous system. And they, uh, it's hard to, to put just to point to a single function because there's many functions, but there's a couple functions that are um, pretty important. That's supposed to be function, functions. One of the functions is just to simply support the nervous tissue. We are also going to form this really interesting structure. You can see that there's a blood supply here. This is a cap capillary. And you have these processes, what are referred to as foot processes on this figure, figure, figure that are going to um, interface with that blood supply, interface with those capillaries. And it actually forms a protective barrier. And we call this the blood-brain barrier. And that blood-brain barrier, which I got another picture of it here. So here you can see the feet of the astrocyte. Here's our capillary. And then we've even taken a small little piece of it and we've blown it up here quite a bit further. So there is actually a separation between blood supply and that brain tissue. And so there's only some materials and some molecules that can actually cross that blood-brain barrier. So the brain is protected from a lot of different types of molecules. Some molecules can readily cross right across the blood-brain barrier. Um, things like steroids and other lipid-based molecules, some drugs. But there are other molecules that can't. Bigger proteins that aren't lipophilic aren't able to cross that blood-brain barrier. Even lighter. So this blood-brain barrier, uh, the, the feet, they're going to be classified as perivascular, just simply meaning around the vascular, sure, around the around the vasculature. We encase the blood vessels with these perivascular feet, which you can see there. Uh, and it creates a tight seal. Now, you'll rem hopefully remember, or at least you'll understand now, that capillary blood supply, the capillaries have, they have individual cells. So here would be a couple different cells. This is the lumen of the capillary bed. And there's spaces between these cells. Sometimes there's even spaces through, tubes through individual cells. And this allows the blood that's inside and really the plasma, the watery component of the blood, to mix with the surrounding extracellular fluid. As long as the molecule is small enough to go between those 
openings, it's going to be able to cross. And a lot of different types of molecules actually do. In the brain, however, we add those paravascular feet that are going to create that tight seal. So things that do creep through, a lot of them actually have to be transported rather than just moving through uh, unrestricted. And so these help to regulate what gets to the, the nervous tissue. And there's actually some pretty unique things that happen as we regulate what can make it into uh, what can make it into the um, into the brain and into the spinal cord. Um, during embryogenesis and the development of the uh, embryo, we begin to produce testosterone and estrogen. Well, really, estrogen, um, a lot of it comes from the fact that mom is carrying it. Mom is producing her own estrogen. So we say that the baby grows up in a maternal environment, a heavy estrogen environment. Females, if the baby uh, is an XX chromosome carrying individual, obviously they want to have female reproductive organs that begin to develop. We also want to have a female brain that begins to develop and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a, a protein that's initially produced by both male and female embryos, and it's called alpha fetal binding protein. An alpha fetal binding protein binds up to estrogen that's being produced or released into the bloodstream of the baby and, and sequesters it, meaning that it doesn't allow it to have any sort of effect. And it prevents estrogen from being able to cross the blood brain barrier. Without estrogen in the brain, what do you think happens to the brain? Does it become feminized or does it become masculinized? Without estrogen. And you would be incorrect. Without estrogen, it actually becomes feminized, and especially things like the hypothalamus become um, cyclic in their release of certain hormones. So 28 days of hormone cycles. Males, early on, they begin to develop um, uh, testicular and other male reproductive organs, and testosterone begins to be produced. Alpha fetal binding protein is still present. All of this estrogen gets sequestered and gets uh, um, trapped up and prevented from crossing the blood brain barrier. However, testosterone does not. Testosterone begins to enter into the blood brain barrier. So, uh, or crosses the blood brain barrier and begins to increase in concentration inside of the brain. But it's not the testosterone that causes masculinization of the brain. There's also a high concentration of an enzyme called aromatase in the brain. And aromatase is the enzyme that's responsible to take testosterone and convert it into estrogen. And so in the male brain, with the presence of testosterone, which can get through the blood-brain bar barrier, it gets converted into estrogen. Estrogen, as the brain develops, causes a pulsatile function to be developed in the hypothalamus, meaning that rather than a 28-day cycle, you have a 24-hour pulse in the release of um, gonadotropins and LS, uh, LH and FSH, which are the hormones that help to regulate things like spermatogenesis in the male and ovum development, ovogenesis in the female. So just kind of a unique thing that happens with the blood-brain barrier. And now you can also go home and you can run a bet tonight and you can say, so what hormone is responsible to masculinize the male brain? And the answer is estrogen. Not just astrocyte. Okay, so a couple other functions here for our astrocytes, in addition to the blood brain barrier. Astrocytes help to regulate uh, the blood flow in the brain. And the way that this is done, the astrocyte is actually responsible to release vasoconstricting and vasodilating substances onto those vessels to cause the vessel to increase and decrease in diameter. 
The astrocytes are also going to metabolize glucose. And by metabolizing glucose, they can supply lactate or lactic acid to the neurons, which becomes a very important metabolic starting point for the production of ACP inside of the neurons themselves. They regulate a hormone or a group of hormones known as the nerve growth factors. So they're going to regulate nerve growth through these NGFs, nerve growth factors, and that's again another class of proteins. So when neurons need to be replaced or they need to go through some differentiation process, we have increases in nerve growth factor to help manage that process. Supply lactate to the neurons. The astrocytes are going to help to remove potassium from the cerebral spinal fluid. And then the astrocytes form scleroses. which is basically a natural occurring band-aid for the brain. So when we have nerve damage, we, replace, we, we produce these things, uh, plaques that can be placed over that site of damage called a sclerosis or sclerosis. So these scleroses are going to be generated at the site of damage. Yeah, where the nerve or the neurons are damaged. So um, if we have damage to the nerve, maybe a small lesion in the, in the nerve, we'll patch it up with a sclerotic tissue. A lot of this is not really all that good. <laughs> Does everybody have everything here? We're going to move on to the peripheral nervous system neuroglia now. the peripheral nervous system, there are going to be two main types of neuroglia here, and they're actually going to sound very similar to some of the neuroglia that we've already talked about that are in the central nervous system. One of the big ones is the Schwann cells. Just by looking at those Schwann cells, what would be the central nervous system in Swiftland? Okay, smiling. What cells in the central nervous system made up of? Uncle. Oligo. Oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes. No. <laughs> Well, it's about time we do some uh, right knee surgery, just need her close. I mean, if you're on the left knee, nobody feels close enough, you know? <laughs> That's my redneck surgeon. <laughs> you're a little high, what haven't what done, man? <laughs> All right, so the Schwann cells. Uh, these are equivalent to the oligodendrocytes, except this is what we find in the peripheral nervous system. They also wrap around the nerve fiber. By the way, nerve fiber, this is another way to say the neuron. 
so wrap around the nerve fibers or around the neuron, they are going to produce myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And again, that myelin is very important in the conduction of the electrical signal. Aids, myelin aids in the electrical signal conduction. Holy cow. The second type of glial cell, microglial cell, that we find inside of the peripheral nervous system is a satellite cell. And <clears throat> what you're looking at here, remember that peripheral nerves, the cell bodies are all trapped up in a structure called the ganglion. So coming off of the spinal column, we have those ganglion and then the rest of the nerve, which is where the neuron axons transmit out into certain regions of the body. That ganglion, we're going to have satellite cells that are basically going to be the insulators of the neuroglia. They're going to protect the neuroglia. Um, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, they're going to protect the uh, ganglion and protect those soma that are found in the ganglion. For the ganglion, they're going to help to regulate the chemical environment. So what are the two types of cells and their locations that produce myelin? In the central nervous system, it's the, the oligodendrocytes. And then in the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells. What does Schwann mean? It's a theory. It's, what did you say? Like... <laughs> When you okay, I played the clarinet and one of the movie things, it was on the swan. I'm really I confused just, now. How did we get to clarinet? <laughs> Whatever. Say say what you just said right before your explanation. The music thing? Something? Is that what you said? It was a music thing? Yeah. Okay, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it's incorrect. It's a guy's name. <laughs> Well, okay. Okay, so myelin. You're looking at a really interesting picture here, and it should look somewhat uh, somewhat familiar. Well, to a muscle <laughs> fiber. To a muscle fiber. Oh, that's so really not that cool. <laughs> so you have the nerve which is comprised, comprised of fascicles, which each fascicle is a bundle of individual neurons. So neurons are not the same as nerves. Nerve fibers are another, is another name for neuron. Okay? Just trying to keep the lingo straight. This is what myelin would look like if we were to zoom in very close on a myelinated fiber. Myelin, also sometimes referred to as a myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath acts as an insulator. So just like the plastic that we find on an electrical wire for the electrical stuff in the house, 
We also have an insulator around these electrically charged or electrically conducting cells. So again, nerve fiber, what's another name for nerve fiber? Neurons. Neurons. So we're going to wrap these cells. And really, it's the membrane that gets wrapped around a whole bunch of times. So in the Schwann cell, um, I don't remember if it... Yeah, so it shows it just a little bit. This is the nucleus. In fact, it gets the, the, the membrane gets wrapped so tightly around there that it squeezes everything up kind of into one spot. So you have this little bulge that exists where the nucleus and some of the other organelles get squished into it as this fiber gets wrapped up. So the material that's present here is going to be everything that we have in the membrane itself, which are going to include proteins, so it becomes proteinaceous. And then also the lipids. And in fact, the lipids become a very diverse mixture of a variety of different types of lipids, including glycolipids, so lipids that contain a sugar, Phospholipids. Is proteinase? Pro is that one word? This is one, one word, proteinaceous. Proteinaceous, not proteinaceous. That's like totally proteinaceous, you know? <laughs> what? What? That was great. That was my, like... I'm like from Hawaii and I'll surf and I also, <laughs> I also teach at a university. You know what I'm saying, bro? No. <laughs> Plus, we're going to have cholesterols. Okay, so both are Schwann cells. And oligodendrocytes are going to produce the myelin. And you'll have many individual cells. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way down. Many individual cells down the length of the axon. my abbreviation for oligodendrocytes. Keep up. <laughs> so by doing this, we end up with a segmented appearance. Okay, so we have the portions that have the cells, and then we have this little patch in between. We have a little exposed patch of membrane from the axon. Wherever you have the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes forming the myelin, that myelin is called an internode. So this is an internode, this is an internode, here's one internode, here's another internode, here's part of another internode, and then you have these little patches of exposed axonal membrane. Those patches are those gaps where we have the exposed membrane. I'm going to have each of you try to say this. Just because this is usually really fun. If you already know how to say it, don't say it. Okay. Nodes of Rambier. Rambier? Yeah. Rambier. Nodes of Rambier. Oh, like in Italy? No, France. <laughs> He's a French guy. Right. So it's the, I love coming down to the southeast. I love you guys, but I'm going to make fun of you right now. This guy was like, yep, no to ready be here. No, it's the node of Rangier. It's a French guy. Oops, oh, did I say internodes? At the end of the day, it means the same yeah. thing. Internodes. Internodes. <laughs> No, because there actually are nodes of ram, ram, ram here as well. 
<laughs> so the node, the inner nodes are where we have the myelin, where the, the cell is located. Then there are gaps or patches of membranes. Those patches are nodes known as the nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. <laughs> Now, we do have some onmyelinated fibers. The thing about the onmyelinated fiber is it actually still is associated with a Schwann cell. Except the Schwann cell doesn't wrap its membrane around a billion times, creating that myelin sheath. So you have one Schwann cell that envelops several fibers or several neurons. So we don't have a spiral, there is no spiraling of the membrane. So we get these grooves, which you can see here, that I'm just trying to figure out why people are laughing. Why are you saying groove? It sounds like the little wine guy. <laughs> so these fibers just like totally run in the grooves in our Schwann cells. And it's just like totally chill. It's getting way out of hand tonight. Okay, so the fibers run in the, the graves in the Schwann cell. <laughs> 